Welcome back. Recall from the first lecture that, historically speaking, cryptography was exclusively concerned with ensuring secrecy of the communication between two parties. This puts us squarely in the context of encryption, which is where we'll begin our study of cryptography. In addition, classical cryptography always assumed that the two communicating parties shared some secret information, what we'll call a key, in advance of their communication. This puts us in the setting of what's known as private key cryptography. This setting is also variously known as the secret key, shared key, or symmetric key setting for reasons that should become clear, but I'll try to consistently use the terminology private key cryptography. So in the setting of private key encryption, we have two users, often called Alice and Bob, who share some secret information, a key, in advance. When Bob has a message, or a plain text, that he wants to send to Alice, he will encrypt that message using the shared key. This generates a ciphertext that he sends to Alice over a public communication channel. Alice can then decrypt that ciphertext using the shared key to recover the original message. Informally, the security guarantee we want is that no eavesdropper who can observe the ciphertext sent across the channel can figure out anything about the underlying message. On the previous slide, we had two distinct users separated in space. Private key cryptography is also commonly used for ensuring secrecy for a single user communicating with himself, as it were, over time. Here, Bob holds a message that he wants to store safely on his laptop. As before, Bob can encrypt the message to obtain a ciphertext, and now store that ciphertext on his laptop. At some later point in time, when Bob wants to recover the message, he can read the ciphertext from the hard drive, and then decrypt it using his key to recover the original message. Here, if an attacker steals the laptop, or is otherwise able to compromise it, that attacker should still be unable to learn anything about the underlying message. I now want to define an encryption scheme more rigorously. Formally speaking, an encryption scheme is defined by specifying a message space M of allowable messages, along with three algorithms, a key generation algorithm, an encryption algorithm, and a decryption algorithm. The key generation algorithm is a randomized algorithm that chooses a key K. The encryption algorithm takes two inputs, a key K, and a message M in the message space. It outputs a ciphertext C. Finally, the decryption algorithm takes as input a key K and a ciphertext C. It outputs a message M, or possibly some error. I want to highlight here some notation I'll be using throughout the course. I use a left arrow to denote assignment to the output of an algorithm that might be randomized, meaning that the output of the algorithm may be different even when run twice on the same set of inputs. I use a colon equals to denote an assignment to the output of a deterministic algorithm. So in this case, this means that we're allowing encryption to possibly be randomized, whereas we're assuming that decryption is deterministic. I use a single equal sign to denote mathematical equality in contrast to assignment. Any encryption scheme is required to satisfy the following basic correctness requirement. For any message M in the message space, and any key K output by the key generation algorithm, if we encrypt M using K to obtain some ciphertext, and then decrypt that ciphertext using the same key, we should get back the same message we started with. I want to illustrate all of this using a simple example of a historical encryption scheme called the shift cipher. Consider encrypting regular English text. We will identify English letters with the numbers from 0 to 25, so A will be associated with 0, B with 1, and so on. The key K will be an integer in the range from 0 to 25. To encrypt a message M using the key K, we simply shift every letter of the plain text by K positions, wrapping around at the end of the alphabet. So, for example, if we encrypt the plain text Hello Worlds using the key C, which, cor which corresponds to 2, then we simply shift each letter of the plain text forward by two positions. For example, H becomes J, etc. D 
Decryption will simply reverse the process by shifting backward. Before defining the scheme more formally, I want to introduce some notation for modular arithmetic that we'll see again later on in the course. You're all probably used to the no notation x equals x prime mod n, which means that x and x prime have the same remainder when divided by n, or equivalently that n divides x minus x prime. In contrast to this, I use the notation bracket x mod n to denote the remainder of x when divided by n, that is, the unique value x prime in the range of 0 to n minus 1, such that x is equal to x prime mod n. Just to illustrate, we have 25 is equal to 35 mod 10, because they both have the same remainder, but 25 is not equal to bracket 35 mod n, because bracket 35 mod n is equal to 5. Now we can define the shift cipher formally. The message space M will be the set of all strings over the lowercase English alphabet. Note that we do not handle uppercase letters, nor do we handle any non-alphabetic characters like numbers, spaces, or punctuation. Our key generation algorithm will choose a uniform key in the range from 0 to 25. This means that each value between 0 and 25 is chosen with equal probability. Now, to encrypt a message consisting of the characters m1 through mt using the key k, we output the ciphertext c1 through ct, where each character ci is computed as mi plus k mod 26. As we have said, decryption just reverses this process, so that the decryption of a ciphertext consisting of the characters c1 through ct using the key k is done by simply outputting the message consisting of the characters m1 through mt, where each mi is just ci minus k mod 26. I leave it to you to convince yourselves that correctness holds. Is the shift cipher secure? It should be pretty clear that it's not. Note that there are only 26 possible keys. So, given a ciphertext, an attacker can simply try decrypting that ciphertext using every possible key. At a minimum, this will narrow down the plain text to one of only 26 possibilities. More likely, though, only one of those possibilities will make sense as normal English text, and that will immediately let the attacker identify that possibility as the true message. For example, imagine you've intercepted the ciphertext displayed here. If you try decrypting using every possible value of the key, you'll get a list containing 25 strings of gibberish plus one that says, hello world. That tells you exactly what message was encrypted to give the ciphertext. Something implicit in the attack I just described is that the attacker is assumed to know the encryption scheme the communicating parties are using. This is known as Kirchhoff's principle, which states that the encryption scheme being used is not to be considered secret, but instead the only secret information is the key shared by the parties. This implies that the key must be chosen randomly. If not, then the attacker knows it. And furthermore, that this key must be kept secret by the parties sharing that key. Sometimes people argue that Kirchhoff's principle doesn't make sense, and that it might give better security to also keep the encryption scheme itself secret. There are several arguments against this line of thinking. First, it is much easier to maintain secrecy of a short key rather than a more complex algorithm. Similarly, it's easier to change the key shared by two parties than to change the algorithms they're using. Perhaps most importantly, allowing the details of the encryption scheme to be public means that we can develop standardized encryption schemes that anyone can use. This makes it much easier for encryption schemes to be deployed and adopted, and also ensures that these schemes receive public scrutiny, thereby increasing our confidence in their security. The key space of an encryption scheme is just the set of all possible keys that can be output by the key generation algorithm. An important takeaway point from our analysis of the shift cipher is that in order to be secure, an encryption scheme must, at a minimum, have a key space large enough to prevent a brute force exhaustive search attack like the one we just described. As we will see, however, having a large key space does not necessarily guarantee that an encryption scheme is secure.